pleasant good afternoon to all of you and a belated happy St. Valentine's Day to you and all your loved ones. Uh, Father Joe didn't receive any Valentine cards, which doesn't surprise me, but, you know, uh, I gave him a big hug anyway, just to wish him a happy St. Valentine's Day. A few questions that came in this past week. Uh, some of them are pretty detailed, so I won't be able to get into them as deep as the person maybe was hoping for. First question is, what are the educational requirements to become a priest? Is there an age requirement, a minimum age, a maximum age? Let's start with the first part of that. What's the educational requirements to become a priest? Well, priest formation ordinarily for a diocesan priest is after four years of college, then they would apply to the seminary. And there would be two years of formation and then there would be four years of theology after those two years of formation. And those two years of formation are so very, very important, helping a person to appreciate who they are as an individual, coming to experience God's personal love for them, having them embrace their own personal history with their family and the like. It's very, very critical. It has to do with a lot of human formation, which is so essential in the formation of uh, a candidate for priesthood. Then there are four years of theology after that. Four years of theology are also combined with pastoral ministry and service in the parish or in some other institutions like a hospital or a prison or an orphanage or a school. So the person has pastoral experience. So I hope that's helpful. That's a diocesan priest. The Jesuits, for example, a little bit more involved they would have a two-year formation after college, and that's primarily to really appreciate the uniqueness and the spirituality of Jesuits. Then after those two years, which would include a 30-day retreat, which is very, very powerful, they would then go on for a master's degree in philosophy, which would be two more years of school. And then when they finished that, then there would be three years they'd be living with the community of Jesuits, whether in a high school or a college, wherever it might be, or in some type of service. It could be in this country or another country. But there are three years of living in the community so that they get a sense of what it's like to be a community member of the Jesuits, uh, what it's like being received into the family. Then following those three years, then the person would do three years of theology. And then following those three years of theology, they would be ordained. And then there'd be a year after that called tertianship. That's a way of deepening their own appreciation for the spirituality of St. Ignatius of Loyola, who's their founder. Is there an age requirement? For the Diocese of Boston, the age requirement, a minimum age, not really. As long as you follow the guideline that I presented earlier. So four years of college, I presume that would bring a person up to the age of 22 ordinarily, 23 right after high school, and then two years of formation, so that would bring a person up to age 24, and then four years of theology, so that would bring them up to probably the age of 28, 27. So that would be the, the minimum age uh, for a person being ordained. Is there a maximum age? Uh, well, Pope John the Twenty Third, I believe their their maximum age, I think, is is fifty, but I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. And that would be for men who were most likely married and were working, and felt a call from the Lord to move into a different type of ministry, or a call to priesthood. And that would be a four-year formation program at. Pope John the 23rd Seminary. Chris Lowe, a member of our parish, completed that program just about five or six years ago. And he's a pastor now over in St. Michael's in Lowell. Second question. What is the history of the sacrament of confession from the beginning to the current day? Wow, we'd be here for a couple, all, a couple of days. How has it changed and when did it become a sacrament? 
Well, first of all, I suggest a person looking for the history of the sacrament and its development from beginning to age to check out the Catholic Encyclopedia. It's always a wonderful resource to check out. That would have the, the real chronological history of the, of the sacrament. It became a sacrament very early life in the church when people were realizing, I'm following the Lord Jesus, but I'm also, I've, I've failed. And primarily, that was all associated with the sacrament of baptism, which has to deal with the forgiveness of sins. So oftentimes in the early life of the church, people would postpone their baptism because they didn't want to be baptized and then enter into some life of sin later on. And then they'll say, oh my God, now what do I do? So that's why oftentimes in the early life of the church, baptism was put off really until a person was almost like the anointing of the sick and close to dying. And then they would ask to be baptized so their, their sins would be completely uh, dissolved and forgiven in God's eyes. How has it changed? It's changed a great deal. That's why, for example, I was just looking at the ritual itself, the rite of penance. It speaks about the adjustments that were made with the sacrament with uh, Vatican II and helping people to appreciate the sacrament itself and its fullness. So ordinarily, when the sacrament is celebrated, years ago, like when I was a youngster in the 50s, you would go in, make your confession, you would start off with your act of contrition, no, so you'd start off with your sins, telling the priest how long it's been since your last confession, and then you would conclude with an act of contrition. And after the priest gave you uh, a penance. Now, oftentimes when it's celebrated, there's a scripture reading prior to the person beginning the confession of their sins. So the priest would welcome the person, then there'd be a scripture reading, then the priest would invite the person to reveal their heart, what it is they want, ask the Lord for forgiveness in their life, then the priest would offer some counsel and a penance, and then the person would make the act of sorrow, the act of contrition. A one that I've always suggested to people when they come to me is the Jesus Prayer, which has been adapted. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, pour out your loving kindness and forgiveness upon me because I am a fragile person. And that's what it means to be a sinner. Its basic meaning is we're fragile human beings, aren't we? That's who we are. And has it changed? Well, it has changed because a lot of times people were focused on their own personal relationship to God. I committed a sin, so I've offended God. But also with Vatican II and the developments in the church, we also realize that what I do, the way I've offended God or others, affects the community. It really does. And the best example I can use of that, or a likely one, if I'm an automobile owner and I don't take care of my car and I go out on the expressway and rush hour and my car breaks down because I didn't take care of it. Well, yeah, I'm suffering with that, but so isn't 200,000 other people who are caught in a traffic jam because I didn't take care of my car. So my t not taking care of my car causes me personal problems, yes, but it also causes personal problems for other people who are pulling their hair out. You know, like, why didn't that guy take care of his car? It wouldn't have broken down due to lack of maintenance and care. So it's also the social implications of our relationship to God and to other people. Because when I'm not in right relationship to God, more than likely I'm not going to be in right relationship with other people. I'm going to have a little edge on my shoulder or an edge to my tone, to my heart, because I just am not in right relationship with God and therefore not in right relationship with myself and therefore not in right relationship with other people. So it's a real identification of the implications of not being in right relationship to God or if I have committed any sin and not ask God's for God's forgiveness through the sacrament of reconciliation. And that's the other big piece is the term years ago was called confession, right? 
Now the sacrament is really about being reconciled. I'm reconciled to God, but also to other people. And that's the real focus. It's not so much pouring out my guilty feelings to God, but also how I have injured other people that I need to be reconciled. So it's not just between God and me, it's between God, myself, and my brothers and sisters whom I need to be reconciled with. And one of the classic examples of that is called restitution. If I have stolen money or taken something that belongs to somebody else, I go to confession, confess it, but then I have to make restitution to that person that I have offended by my actions. So I have to return that item without really calling attention to myself. And if I can't do that, then I go about it in some way that I can restore that item to that particular person. Or if I have taken a significant amount of money and I need to pay that back, fine, I can do that maybe anonymously. And then if you're not able to do that without causing direct attention to yourself, you could sub substitute by giving that money away to a charity or some very, very needy cause. Again, as a gesture of your sincerity and your f seeking God's forgiveness and that of other people that I've offended. That's a long, long shot <laughs> response to a question. But again, the big thing is checking out the Mer uh, Catholic Encyclopedia about the history of the sacrament reconciliation. Now David has a surprise question. Okay, let's see if I can... All right. When you go to a wedding reception, do I dance? Why not? Actually, I don't go to wedding receptions anymore because I'm just like a, an, ex, an extra bump on the, on the log. Like, what are you going to do at the reception? You just usually sit there and then people around you, you may not really know who they are. They, they don't really know. They're a little uncomfortable. Talk, how do I talk to a priest? All right? They get kind of nervous about that. And also, it's really for the couple and their families. And many times, you may not know the families all that well. You just might know the couple because you've met with them four or five times. But you may not really know the rest of the family. And the couple are so involved themselves, you don't have much time with them at the wedding, right? And also, do I dance? Uh, I would, I have done at my niece's weddings. I've gone to those receptions uh, and my nephews because I'll be dancing with family members and having a good time with them. So I hope that's helpful to you. And I'm not much of a dancer anyway, okay? I'd rather sit down and, and eat. <laughs> Blessings. Have a beautiful, safe day. And thank you so much for your faithful lives and generosity to one another.